Welcome to this first lecture of the sixth week in on the course machine learning. Uh, this lecture will divide it into parts, but the whole week will be focused on the area of artificial neural networks and their role in machine learning. So you have heard uh, a little about neural networks uh, earlier in the course, uh, but I will repeat a few important things before we go into the more detailed uh, descriptions of this approach. So, regarding the inspiration for, uh, for this approach, uh, the main inspiration is the human or even animal nervous systems. It means the nervous systems of the body, but maybe from the side of inspiration, particularly the brain. So, so the current model in neuroscience is that nervous activity is based on very small atoms called neurons. And, and these neurons, they work in an uh, electrochemical way and they tr transmit signals to each other. And the terminology is pretty straightforward. There is a cell body, that's the center of a neuron. There are some input channels, they're called dendrites. There is an output channel, it's called an axon. And the process where uh, this unit sends uh, a signal is, is called firing. Uh, there is also another word used that is pretty important um, to know, and it's what's called synapse. And actually, a synapse is the point where the axons f sending out the signals connect to the dendrites of other. So it's, it's the connection points between the, the communication elements, uh, so to say. One very important um, point here is that in the animal system or human system, uh, neurons are not homogeneous. There are a, a lot of different kinds of neurons uh, in, in the body. So they are tailored uh, to specific purposes. Um, but if you abstract, of course, you can say that more or less they work in the way I, I just described. So furthermore, all these atomic elements, the neurons, are connected in huge network. Uh, so, to give you the order uh, of complexity here, one can say there are, one used to say that there are 100 billion of neurons in the human brain, and 10,000 times as many connections. So, actually, you can see there are a million of billion neuro, uh, connections in the brain. And you can see, if you have an analogy with parameters in another system, you can say that the, the, the property of, of that connection, so you have so many parameters to, to adjust uh, in order to define the functionality of, of, of the system. While the real thing, as I described uh, in the earlier slides, is a very complex, heterogeneous, system. Uh, we now turn to computer science again and define what we call the computational model for artificial neural networks, which is of course inspired by, by the real, but very much simpler and very much uh, abstract more, and very much more homogeneous. So, an artificial neural network, or ANN, is a network of nodes, or units, that we call artificial neurons. And these are connected by edges. So the corresponding graph is directed. Typically there is one layer of input nodes, one layer of output nodes, and an arbitrary number of layers in between. And we call those layers hidden. Um, this is not the to total truth, uh, because there may be some systems where you have 
uh, edges that are bi bidirectional and where there is no big distinction between input and output. But those are exceptions. Um, so edges typically have a weight that can be adjusted. And uh, this weight increases or decreases the strength of the signal uh, coming via that connection. Actually, the weights are very important because when we are going to talk about learning, uh, one can say that the functionality of the system are, are very much decided on by, by the setting of the weights. And therefore, by changing the weight, the system can somehow learn. Uh, so the output of each neuron computed by some typically nonlinear function of the sum of the inputs given that that sum exceeds a threshold. Potentially, all the neurons can fire in parallel. So this is not the, if, if potentially it is a totally parallel system, but many times there are some temporal constraints put on this, which means that uh, there are a sequential uh, set of events going on. Many times, in, in real applications, um, the layers are given certain functions. So this means that we don't have a network that, that is um, totally homogeneous, that a lot of things can happen anywhere. It's the design of the network is such that in certain layers, certain things happen in other layers, certain other things happen. But that's very much up to the detailed engineering when solving a particular problem. Um, so, also typically, not always, uh, signals travel from the input level to the output, which is natural. Um, but it could be so that uh, there are, are, are loops, which means that, that signals are reprocessed. However, uh, if we uh, run a data item, through the system, uh, we get some output. And then, of course, we have a data set and we run all the ideas. So, so the whole process of running all our data items, all our data set through the, the particular network we have, that is normally called in, in the ANN terminology for an epoch. The ANN model is an abstract model, but hopefully you already understood that there can be Many variants on these networks. So the purpose of this slide is just to exemplify to you and give you some of the uh, important keywords uh, uh, to get a flavor of that there are many different uh, networks. Uh, and in during this week, we will look at uh, not a whole but a representative subset uh, of these networks, and I will try to explain. Uh, the, the purpose uh, behind the different uh, designs. Let's for a moment look at, at the single neuron and um, look at uh, what actually happens when that neuron fires. So we have a set of inputs, x1 to xn, uh, to this particular neuron. And for each of those connections, input connections, there is a weight. And uh, then we have a threshold. And the role of the threshold is that you can say that there is an amount of signals coming in, uh, which is um, uh, calculated as, as the, the weighted sum of the, of the inputs. But uh, the neuron will only fire if th that amount, the total amount of, of signals coming in is exceeding this, uh, this threshold. And finally, even if the, 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 the neuron fires, um, it's just not a, normally a binary output, but uh, the output is actually then a function of this, this sum of signals. And uh, there are many different choices for, for that function, uh, which also is an important uh, characteristic of, of a particular network. So um, we want to learn, eventually we will look at that later, uh, how, how to adjust the weights. Uh, 
thereby changing the functionality of network and thereby learning. However, it's not only the weights are important, the thresholds also have some importance uh, for the functionality. So uh, normally one uses some kind of trick to uh, homogenize the system. So in a way, you try to get rid of, technically get rid of the threshold and in a way convert it to a kind of a nominal weight. So you can see on this slide, in the end, uh, one can take away the threshold, introduce a zero input, um, always having the signal of one, and then you can set the weight of that uh, additional zero input uh, to minus the threshold. In that case, we call the, the, the value uh, of that weight for a bias. Uh, but this is just a, a technical transformation to also allow that we we can learn uh, the bias or threshold through the same lear uh, learning mechanism that we use for, for the weights. On this slide you can just uh, look at an example of how to use the mechanism on the, the last slide. So uh, let's look at a network, uh, uh, look at a neuron with uh, a certain set of bits, it puts 553, then we can and a set of weights that we predefine, and then we can calculate the weighted sum, and we get an, a result which is 7. Then we have a threshold of 3, so we, we, we subtract, and the outcome then uh, is uh, is four, which is uh, which is about zero, so that's fine. Uh, and then uh, before we send out the signal, we also have to apply a function, and we make a choice of function. And the choice we have made in this case, you can see to the right. So you can see this. Uh, I do some lookup there, so you look at the value of four, and then you get uh, the output one in that particular. Uh, case. And what you see at the bottom here is exactly this, uh, the same thing, but there you can also see uh, how the threshold is converted into this extra input layer. There are many kinds of so-called activation functions uh, or transfer function. This is the function who transform the final output from the neuron. Um, and um, we will come back to this during uh, during the week. My comment on this point is that if you have a nonlinear problem, and then you have some problem-solving model for handling a nonlinear problem, um, a very naive common sense fact is that you, you have to include nonlinear elements in your model in order to be able to treat uh, a nonlinear problem. So therefore, and this goes of course also for neural networks, so this means that if you want your network to be able to handle nonlinear problems, it, it's wise to include some elements in the model that is nonlinear. And actually the choice of this activation function is one of the key points where, where you can see to that this happens. So, if you only have linear activation function, you may have a problem. But if you have a nonlinear activation function, you could design your system so it also can potentially handle nonlinear problems. As always, for a particular approach, it's important to understand how do you actually solve problems uh, for, for this approach. So, in the neural network, case, uh, what you have to do is you, 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 you have to model your problem and then you have to map that problem model onto typically the neurons in the input net, uh, input level. And, and when you have done that, then you start the computation and then you get some, some, some result in the output layer. And, but then of course you also have to see to that the, the form of solution you, you, you desire have to be uh, possible to extract. 
from from the output layer. Uh, I mean, the simplest case uh, and it's a very usual case is that the, the input is a feature vector. So you describe the object or situation uh, you want to analyze in terms of a feature vector. And then in the simplest case, then you could simply map your feature vector onto uh, neurons in, in the input layer. Uh, however, there are two cases that we will come to back to during the week uh, that the uh, the input elements are not as simple as that. It could be so that there are complex sequences in space or time uh, and that uh, that um, demands some special treatment. But it could also be that the, the uh, objects have a totally different form of representation. So every input can be an image. Uh, it can also be uh, like some speech profile and um, that it, it um, uh, that situation will also need special uh, considerations and I, I actually these two cases is complex sequences and uh, non-symbolic uh, input items like images are, are the two important special cases that have to be treated this slide is intended to give you uh, a picture of how the neuro artificial neural network area developed initially. I call it here the childhood of the area. And essentially you can see that there is a history here for 40 years, from the 40s actually, up to the mid-80s. Um, and um, it's, let's start with, with, with the end. So actually uh, the end point here is, is that two things happened in the mid 80s. That uh, the term deep learning was, was term. You, you will hear a lot about deep learning, but actually it was coined as a term in 1986 uh, by one researcher uh, in machine learning. But it was not used about uh, for for artificial neural network. It was used for for for, for some other kind of symbolic uh, machine learning. Uh, at the same time, more or less, uh, some researchers, uh, well-known researchers like Rumelhart, Hinton, and, and, and colleagues, published a, a key article on how you can actually use. Uh, artificial neural lessons for, for solving a practical problem. Uh, and uh, that article was kind of the, the starting point for, for the strong growth uh, uh, of this area uh, as a key technique within machine learning. Uh, however, ir ironically, uh, they didn't call it deep learning at the time. They called it um, around artificial neural network or connectionist learning and, and so on in, in 1986. Okay, so let's see what led up to this. So, so essentially it all started in the 40s and if I would name two, 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 two people who contributed originally. So McCullough and, and, and Pitt, uh, they actually introduced the first model of this kind. And if you read, look at that model, it has many of the characteristics of what people have done ever, ever since. Uh, so it's actually a very key initial uh, contribution. Uh, however, more or less in parallel, other people like Donald Hebb presented uh, uh, complementary theories uh, for this, uh, which has also has influenced. We, we will also see, come back to that. And then actually, like in the next decade, there were some experiments. Uh, people tried to build actually some simple uh, neural network machines. The work on the perceptron, which is actually the first real implementation. And then in, in the 60s, there were some very, very important uh, results in the uh, neural science field uh, on uh, how our vision systems. Uh, and you will see in a later lecture this week that that work from, from the 60s 
has really inspired the, the approach that now more or less are taken uh, in, in this area to, to handle the learning based based on images. So this is, is, is the initial story. As for many areas, it goes very slow in the beginning. It took 40 years from, from the, the first ideas to, to uh, something concrete could be demonstrated. But, uh, of course, when it's taken off, it goes much faster. Let's have a look at uh, a few of these early works. So, the really important work by Emma Culligan Pitts. For the first time, they tried to demonstrate on a, how a neuron-like unit can perform logical operations. So actually what they did, they used, just looked at a single neuron and they devised the first attempt for modeling that. With a very simple model, with your binary output, you have no function that transforms that output. You have inputs positive inputs and what the negative input, the inhibitory inputs. And, and the inputs had all the same weights. And of course, as a signal as a series one, it's, it's pretty simple. Also, they had this rule that if you get a, an input one on the inhibitory input, or zero on the inhibitory input, uh, it will uh, uh, have a veto uh, power in the situation. So, it's not actually identical to later approaches, but um, it, it shows uh, the basic uh, architecture. Uh, what was also observed in, in their work, uh, which is kind of interesting, that they very already in their original article observed that there are certain logical operations that, like XOR that cannot be solved by a single unit can be solved by, by a system of units, but it cannot be solved by a simple unit of this, this kind. Uh, uh. Another important early work was that by Donald Hepp. Uh, we will have uh, treat this separately during this week. What I want to say now is, is just a few words about the, the basic idea that Hap had. So essentially the idea of Hap was the following, that if you assume uh, that the, the, that the uh, neurons um, fire or act in, in parallel, it is a fact that if, if two uh, neurons uh, fire at the same time and they are connected uh, that parallel uh, firing of the two connected neural would put normally strengthen uh, the connection between them which means that the learning that should take place is to really increase the weight uh, of, the, of that connection while uh, if parallel uh, excitations uh, of connected neurons uh, give the opposite result, so one is, uh, is one and the other is zero, uh, then one should typically uh, lower the strength of that connection in, in the learning process. So actually then Hebs devised a model, uh, a formal model for, uh, for that kind of basic idea. So I can say it's another way of updating philosophy for updating weights than uh, in some of the other systems. Finally, a word about a kind of interesting system that was built in 1956, actually the same year as the, the area of artificial intelligence was, was, uh, was coined. And uh, it's, it's built by one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence named Marvin Minsky. So what actually he and his group try to do is not to devise a software system, but actually build a machine. So they built a machine of 40 synapses, which as, as you may remember then is the, the, the connection point between the, the output of one neuron and input or other. And, and as you can see on this image, this is a, a picture 
on one of those synergies. So, so actually there was a physical machine consisting of 40 of these things and there was complicated me um, electrical mechanical connections uh, among them. So, so as far as I know, this is the first attempt to really uh, physically implement uh, the ideas of uh, color gun pits. So this was the end uh, of this part, so we will continue uh, in part two.